Good evening. I welcome one and all for uh, today's uh, special lecture in the series of um, Raja Ramana Memorial Lecture Series. Today we have a very special lecture also uh, because it's starting a new activity at NIAS. I would like to first also sp uh, um, uh, extend our special welcome to uh, Dr. Raja Ramana's family. His daughter, Ms. Nirupa Ramana, is here. and. Uh, uh, with her relatives. I am really glad all of you are participating today. Um, we are very happy and excited to announce a new initiative in NIAS, Mathematics Heritage, which is coordinated at NIAS by Dr. Nitin Nagaraj and Dr. Shailaja Sharma, which begins to take shape today with this inaugural lecture by Professor Rodam Narasimha. NIAS has a long history of engagement with history and philosophy of mathematics and stalwarts like Professor Ram Ramana and Professor Narsimha and others have lit way by pointing not only to the great breakthroughs achieved in India during the approximately two and a half millennia, right up to 19th century, but also highlighting the relevance of its philosophical underpinnings to contemporary directions in science. It is as a mark of respect towards the body of contemporary work in unearthing and studying the Indian mathematical heritage that the present initiative towards studying, preserving, and enabling this heritage has been taken up. We are particularly indebted to Professor Narsimha for his illuminating contributions and direction setting in this regard, which will help us shape this initiative. The present lecture is the first in a series of scholarly talk on the Indian mathematical heritage, which will be held at NIAS, both to promote discussions of this area, to attract the attention of scholarly community and the general public. The Math Heritage Initiative is envisaged to take up systematic and serious work in the area of studying the history, philosophy, and contributions of the Indic mathematic tradition, as well as its dissemination to different audiences in line with academic mandate and overall vision of NIAS. I thank everyone for being here for this very special lecture. I request uh, Professor V.S. Ramamurthy to please uh, take over, chair the session, and introduce the series and the speaker. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this 14th Memorial Lecture, Dr. Raja Ramana Memorial Lecture. Uh, many of you in this audience uh, need no introduction to Dr. Raja Ramana, but for the visitors here who are part of our training program and for the youngsters in the audience, let me say a few words about Dr. Raja Ramana. First and foremost, he was the founding director of this institute in which you are participating in this program now. Um, he is a nuclear scientist by training, and he was in Baba Atomic Research Center, the erstwhile atomic energy establishment, Rambe, for a number of years, almost his entire career. I had the good fortune of uh, working with him as a student, and um, I would like to describe him as a non-standard scientist. He, he, if you go and tell him that I have done this, an excellent agreement with uh, the literature, he will say, very good, good job, go and do, this is not the place where you should be working and do, go and do something different. But on the other hand, you go and say, well, I did this, but it doesn't seem to be in agreement with uh, many of the papers which, uh, which I see in literature. He says, huh, that's where you should be. I want you to assure me that you have done your best and come back after 15 days. If you go back and say, st still there is a difference which I cannot reconcile, he says, that's where you should be working. He, I will call him, he is an uh, anomaly chaser. Wherever there is a difference of opinion, then you spend your time. If you are in agreement, you don't have to do anything. Forget about it. it is not there. So I, I ask, always remember him as a non-standard uh, scientist and an excellent uh, teacher. Uh, he did his PhD from King's College London in nuclear physics and joined the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research as a researcher in the year 1949. And then he continued till he reached the top position as Secretary to Government of India and Chairman Atomic Energy Commission. Then he went on to become Minister of State for Defense 
he was a member of the rajya sabha and uh, he, he had a very multifarious uh, um, career profile um, nias was a kind of a different chapter for him he started this institute uh, gave it a mandate very different from the mandates of many of the rnd institutions in this country uh, together with uh, jrd tata was uh, who was uh, probably the first uh, person to conceive this institution he gave a different direction to this institution uh, not the standard uh, standard again his description of a non standard scientist comes in very clearly clearly there and um, um, apart from his um, reputation as a nuclear scientist and a science administrator he was also a great uh, connoisseur of music and an excellent player on the piano he has given several uh, concerts by himself and his uh, love for science and music he was also a philosopher in addition to this i mean maybe because of that or in addition to it, i don't know he was also a philosopher with a deep love for the country and its and its rich culture i am indeed very happy to be part of this uh, memorial lecture Uh, the 14th of the series the lecturer of the evening is uh, professor rodam narsimha uh, honorary professor at the jawaharlal nehru center for advanced scientific research in bangalore uh, i've been uh, seeing him listening to him for a number of years and i would say he is also a non standard scientist in my assessment he doesn't do uh, one science and only that science and nothing else and as you can see he is an aerospace scientist with strong interest in atmospheric dynamics uh, but he is also interested in the history of indic mathematics not the history which you hear in science congress very often of a different kind and uh, he has uh, he has authored books on this in this particular area and more importantly and more relevantly he was also the director of this institute for, uh, for several years after dr rajaramanna and gave uh, their leadership Uh, both in terms of financial stability as well as in terms of uh, the kind of research which is uh, being done uh, he is uh, he's the co co-editor of uh, of an enso- encyclopedia of classical indian science and also nature and culture both are, both do not belong to the uh, standard science it is part of his uh, non standard science he is one of the few fellows of the royal society of london foreign associate of both the us national academy of engineering and the us national academy of sciences he won the aiaa fluid dynamics award in 2000 and trieste prize for science prize for engineering sciences in 2008 uh, he is also an batnagar prize awardee and several other awards to his credit uh, i am very happy that he will be delivering this uh, lecture in honor of uh, dr ramanna Uh, Dr. Professor Narsimha, may I request you to give the talk? I thank you very much, Dr. Ramuthi, for those kind words you said. I'm um, a, it's a great honor to me that uh, I've been asked to give this Ramana Memorial Lecture, and uh, there are many friends here from Nias. <laughs> from other places in nl institute and so on and it's nice it's nice to see them and uh, so i say my friends and all the people who come on this course incidentally it's not by design i was very pleased to see that uh, this course has the theme the the promise of india and there's a little bit to do with what i'm going to say and that's why i i put in more algorithms and I exams here uh so i'm happy to be able to speak to all the people who are taking part in this course and to my many friends here in in yes and the others who joined us on this occasion now i must first of all say that um that ramana uh, was a person who actually i knew even earlier although i did not have anything directly to do with uh, uh the atomic energy commission 
I did do one project for them when I was here at the faculty at the institute <laughs> for them on the calendar of one of your reactors. But apart from that, I uh, happened to meet uh, Dr. Ramana first when the near famine in India made uh, Mrs. Gandhi ask him to run a committee to find out why our med department can't do better than what they're now doing. I'm putting it in uh, simple words. But he wanted, he wanted to see what kind of reform should be made in the med department. He knew that I had some interest in atmospheric dynamics. So he put me also on that committee and, uh, well, we had very interesting meetings with Dr. Ramana at the chair. Uh, as he says, non-standard scientists like me. And um, I got to know him very well. And after that, um, I got involved in the 1980s in the LCA project when I and some others who believed in it were trying to persuade the government to actually go ahead with the LCA. It made a great deal of sense for India. I'm not going to go into the details there. Dr. Ramchand is here in the audience. He will have heard those discussions earlier. And um, one day in one of those meetings, which was held at South Block on the LCA, as I came out of the room, Dr. Raja Ramana was also walking there. He had just taken over. He had, you know, he had just taken over there, but he hadn't heard of the LCA project. So he said, what are you doing here? Well, I said, you know, we are discussing the LCA project. The LCA project, what is LCA? <laughs> so, so he said, after the meeting, you please come and tell me what it is. So I had a long discussion with him. He was very helpful, and I think it was Dr. Raja Ramana who made it possible to push the project, and uh, well, we could uh, speak frankly about it, and therefore, that was also one great contribution he made. I don't know if uh, everybody knows about even in the LCA project, that Dr. Ramana being there at that time was very important. Well, um, I'm, um, I sort of extended slightly that title, A View of Indic Mathematics. That's really what I intended to say earlier. But I thought it might be interesting to look at where our mathematics stands. i come back to that in a moment. And um, the outline here uh, for since long, after a brief introduction, I talk about uh, classical Indian science and mathematics in particular, and algorithms. Uh, Indians loved algorithms, that's what I want to say. And classical Greek science and axioms. The Greeks loved axioms. The Greeks loved axioms. The Indians did not like axioms, actually. It was a deliberate choice. Um, so I want to discuss these and make a comparative assessment of these views. And the strange history of Greek science sort of disappeared relatively early, around the second century AD. But um, there was a problem in Europe uh, around the 15th, 16th century. And the comments that Bacon made on Greek science were so severe, I think we should know exactly why people were upset with Greek mathematics. The contribution, actually Indian, India made many contributions to the European scientific revolution which occurred at that time. And I want to tell you how, what those were and how it happened. And I want to ask you, there are more than one way of doing science. Is there only one standard way accepted by everybody? Or have there been more, has there been more than one way of doing it? And there are questions of the last century, the century, the 20th century, especially in the second half. Meanwhile, very powerful computers and artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning and so on, these are going to affect the way we do many things. Is that good? Are the bad things there? What are, what are their likely impact on the way that mathematics is done, for example? Uh, I mean, these are all personal opinions. And what about the future? Now, <clears throat> in the first place, we must understand 
that the history of science in the world is a very checkered history. Uh, the, the science and technology that came from the revolution that occurred, scientific revolution occurred over Europe, and uh, it was very powerful. It enabled the West to be a world power in a relatively short while. But uh, between the period between the 3rd to the 16th century, 3rd century CE after Christ and the 16th century, the Europe, Europe was in the dark ages. There's nothing happened there, very interesting. While Asia was shining, India in mathematics, all our great men were in that period, starting from, um, you know, Aryabhata, let's say, there were some earlier to Pingala and so on all the way to the 16th century, after the Kerala school. After the 16th century, things changed a great deal, partly for, I think, the political and military things that had happened in this country. And I consider that the 300 years following the 16th century, following the Kerala school, were in some sense India's dark ages. And that's where this comes in. Can we get out of the dark ages? Are we out of it already? Or uh, if you are still there, how, what, what these things might imply for that question. So the history of word science is checkered. It's not been only at one place. Um, here is a figure I've taken from Professor Fritz Stahl. Many people at uh, um, Nias will have known him very well. Um, he's a great friend of India, studied many things here. Um, I don't completely agree with this uh, thing, but uh, basically what it says is, well, the first thing that uh, you can trace is Mesopotamia, around 3000 BC. And um, India became um, the source of mathematics and so on, uh, the sciences, uh, around 1000 BC and a little after that. And so were the Chinese. So the Indian and Chinese civilizations are about the same age. Um, from this point of view. The Greek came later and there were some contacts between India and Greece and also between Mesopotamia and Greece and Mesopotamia and India and the Chinese and so on. After 700, things began to change. India, of course, I think it, in some ways it was a golden age for India. And after about um, 1500, around 1500, is where actually science began to prosper in Europe in an extraordinary way. And uh, within a couple of centuries, Europe was the leader in science and technology, not India, in mathematics, not India, not the Chinese. Okay. And there's one long line here about linguistics, which was Professor Stott's favorite, the language. India is the earliest, uh, uh, the earliest has a, has, a, has a history where the study of linguistics started earliest, and especially in Sanskrit. And uh, Fritz Stahl used to like, he's given lectures in this hall, he used to say that um, what Euclid is to Greece, um, Panini is to India. <laughs> so the connections between language and so on are also there. And we are right now in this modern thing at the bottom. Uh, the one problem, if you look at Indic science in general, and classical Indic science, and there are two extreme views. The country is sort of polarized. One view is that India, India science is really not worthwhile at all. And I've heard a very distinguished Indian scientist, I don't want to tell you who he is, who in a meeting when I was there, said India is not a scientific civilization. And he said, there's no scientific knowledge here at all. <laughs> well, that surprised me. But on the other hand, there's the other extreme, where people will say, our ancient research knows everything, all the way down to quantum mechanics and relativity and so on, making aircraft, etc., etc. And that Vedic mathematics knew the speed of light and so on. This is not true either. And we know that uh, that did not happen. But the most interesting thing is that while both statements are wrong, the fact is that there was a long period 
during which Indian classical mathematics was about the most active and most interesting in the world. And I don't think I'm saying it from personal um, prejudice. I'd like, like to tell you why, why that seems so. So as far as I'm concerned, neither of these views is correct. And a detailed study shows that Indic science followed a different line from the Greeks. For the Greeks, for science meant one thing, or mathematics meant one thing for the Greeks, and a different thing for the Indians. The Indians thought differently about mathematics. But they did a great job uh, on the mathematics that they thought was more important, was the real thing. And so did the Greeks. But the Greek thing collapsed after about the second century AD. And the Indian thing kept going. And um, it was uh, remarkably, I think, uh, original and um, survived for a long time. Now, as far as India was concerned, the heart of the matter was algorithms, calculations, computation, okay? Observation and computation. If you look at uh, astronomy, which was the one which demanded the most mathematics, observation, computation was the key words. You know, first observation. Now, that's actually interesting because we are told that Indians are not very good at observing, making experiments and so on. <laughs> but that was the top thing. And after that came calculation. After that became comparison. And as you'll see later on, this is old phrase, Druggaanitaikya, which comes even today on Panchangas. Druggaanitaikya is getting Druk, what you see, and Ganita, as you calculate, Aikya, they should be the same. Those are the things that are the big objective. Now, um, as Greece said, well, I told you that there are dark ages. <coughs> but um, the work done in India <coughs> gradually diffused westwards through West Asia, Egypt, and Europe, beyond Greece, by about the 16th century CE. It did not go directly to Europe. There were many steps in between. And it led to a new epistemology in Europe, followed by a scientific revolution and that's affected the whole world and during the last four or five centuries. Together with the Industrial Revolution of the 17th and 18th century, it created a new Europe, which had become very powerful. They made very good use of the science and technology for a variety of purposes. And it was responsible for their prosperity. It was also responsible for the military and political power almost across a very large part of the world. And Partly because of this and other reasons, uh, Indic science virtually collapsed about four or five centuries ago. And it's very hard to see many contributions from India there. Now, I can go about these things in great detail, but I don't think we will have time to do it. So I'll sort of skip it. Well, if you take uh, the fundamental text on astronomy in India, it goes back to Ajavata. 499 CE, one of those few cases where the date is known very precisely, and this was done. And, um, and he wrote this book called the Aribati, yeah? 121 slokas is all what it is, but it's had a profound effect on astronomy in India for more than a thousand years. But even today, the Panchangas will say Aribati. Yeah? Now, it starts, um, it's very practical. It starts with, directly gets into the business. In the chapter one itself, it makes its own method of writing numbers. How initial conditions have to be given to predict where the planets are going to be. What are the planetary orbits, the Earth's rotation. And just to give you an example, also a table of signs, which is this uh, very funny pronunciation, mucky, bucky, pucky, and so on. And you don't know what that is, but it's actually a notation for numbers. I won't go, go I won't tell you in detail what those things are. It is there in an article. It is well known. And, uh, but there are, these are all the differences in the sense. The first difference between successive signs in the first quadrant, uh, 24 angles in that quadrant. It is correct to four decimal places. Okay? It is a, a remarkable thing, but the writing of it is as clever as the work. Ingenious system. And if you read it, the thing which struck me is clever, is playful, terse, not one wasted word or sound, deep, unfussy, and very business-like. Most of the book is that way. 
Well, here are all the things that uh, Yaryavati talks about in the next uh, chapter on just Ganita. The notation, it, it makes a special notational place for numbers. Square roots, cube roots, how do you find the volume of pyramids, how do you find pi, volume of the sphere and so on. But no models of the kind that we are uh, used to from Greece or even from the kind that we are used to. Hello, Dr. <laughs> Sarah Naik. I'm sorry I've not seen you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, but no models of the kind that the Greeks loved. But the Indians did not like it. And there were good reasons why the Greeks loved it, as far as the Greeks were concerned. Good reasons why Indians did not like it, for their own reasons. And, um, well, there are all these other things. I won't go into those in de 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 detail. How to sum a series in uh, is an arithmetical progression. What is the sum of the series, sigma n squared, n cubed, rule of three, which we all learned in our high school. And how do you solve linear indeterminate equations? It had the concept of the Earth's gravity, but it did not have the gravitational law, the law of gravitational forces. Why Earth's gravity? Because the first thing people ask about the our orbit is, if you say the Earth is round, because incidentally, I have made it clear that the Earth is round. Why? Because that's the shadow on the eclipse. It's clear that it was a shadow, not all the stories that we hear on eclipse day. And then you say, if it's spherical, why are people not falling off? Well, that's because the Earth pulls us and holds it there. But these are made as statements on the side. They're not saying it's a great discovery that there is a gravity in such thing. <coughs> Similarly, relativity. I mean, the relative, uh, the principle of relative velocity. Uh, not, not, not the Einstein type, but just the na usual dynamics. And so on. It goes on like that. Earth is round from the solar eclipse and so on. We also often think there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, feeling in India for um, divine things which, which they appeal to when they do all of this. I found that it's not true. Uh, the astronomers, in particular, were very clear. They wanted to make sure that there was no, no God in the whole picture. <laughs> and we are doing this from observation. So, at that the end, there's a little verse once again, saying basically, well, I'll, I'll, I'll have a better translation of this later on. All these dreams, uh, these gems, I have dredged from the ocean of knowledge, both true and false, with my own brain. Okay, want to make sure. However, that brain, however, is the gift of Brahma to him. <laughs> and that, uh, that attitude was actually very common among uh, these people, among uh, it more than 50, 50 to 60 algorithms. In, in, what is it? It's a book of 50 or 60 algorithms. And as I said, yeah, here is another person who also doesn't want to attribute anything to scripture, God or anything. He's almost at the other end of the, uh, of those uh, 14th centuries that uh, India, uh, where India was a leader. Um, well, here's the theorem of the diagonal, that's what they call, the one usually called Pythagoras theorem. It's not Pythagoras theorem. If you say it's not Pythagoras theorem, everybody will make headlines. They have made it when I said it <laughs> in the newspapers. But you can take it from me. This is the opinion of Western scholars themselves. There was a German scholar who looked at all of it in great detail. He came to the conclusion that Pythagoras had nothing to do with it. It was actually an announcement made by a politician, a, a Roman politician, so that he would give more credit to, <laughs> to Greece, for example, or Rome, and so he wanted to attribute it to Pythagoras. Anyway, what Nilikanta says is, all this is rooted, what I've done, what he has done, is rooted in Yukti and not in Agama. It's human intelligence. It's not scriptures. It's not revelation. It's not authority. They make it very clear. And so people who sometimes think that Indian thinking is irrational are completely wrong. There are, of course, people thinking in many different ways in India. And I think the Indian culture, Indian uh, custom is that you have your views strongly, but you don't prevent other people from holding their own views. See, that's why we have thousands of gods and festivals and so on. Well, everybody can do what he likes. We may not like it, but we do it our way. That's okay. But he wants to say that this is not any, nothing from, from the scriptures. 
Well, I don't know. Pick out some of those knowledge. Ah, so how do you get this knowledge? Well, once again, the Indian view is this. I take this from Nilikanta. You see, the other end of that uh, long period. About all that is unknown, only Pariksha, the observation. Pariksha we know, examination, observation. Can deal with knowledge. Number one is observation. First thing that the students had to learn to do was observation. And then, Grahagati Jnanam Anumanena. Anumana is inference. Knowledge of planetary motions has then to be obtained, predicted by inference. And they attributed to, Nalikanta attributes it to Aryabhata and Bhaskara and so on. But the point is, the truth is in the algorithms, which make those computations, because they then agree with your observation. You can say that that's why I put it there. Well, Indian attitudes, uh, I, I think I probably should not go through it in, in great detail. You see, it's tolerant rather than doctrinal rationalism. All happiness is rooted in good science, that's what Charka said. So, they were very, very aware of the value of science, mathematics, and so on. Charka said, Sukham Samagram Vijnana Vimele Chapratishtiram. So, well, I can go on like this. The Sankhyas, the Sankhyas are an anti school. I, I want to make a statement not directly related to mathematics, but to understand this. See, we all think of Hinduism as a religion. Hinduism is not a religion as understood in the English, in the sense of the English word. If you have a religion, you have to have one God, you have to have a book, you have to have a prophet and so on. In India, we have numerous prophets, numerous languages, and a very large number of gods. Any group is uh, free to worship so it's its own God. And there were even philosoph philosophy, standard, uh, this is classical philosophy, which was non-theist in school. If you ask them what about God, they would say, well, you know, there's not enough evidence, so we don't want to talk about God. But it's a respected uh, darshana. You see, if, you, if you look at Bhagavad Gita, it comes the, one of the first things that comes out there is uh, Sankhya and uh, um, what is the other one? There are two of them, Sankhya and Yoga, yes. So, no unnecessary hypothesis, no matter of nothing. Yeah. The Vedas are human, therefore they are not necessarily flawless. Nature is unintentionally helpful, and so on. Although Shankara was a critic. Here once again, I am just including it. This, this is the verse that I mentioned earlier, Ajibatiya. From the ocean of the real and the unreal, I will dread these gems of knowledge, sailing the boat of my own mind, which has been the gift of Brahma. So I am just emphasizing this to tell you that the reasoning that went on during that period in these well-known texts was rational, did not depend on religion, but uh, was very particular about the role of observation and of uh, mathematics. Okay, I don't uh, want to go to this in detail. Now let's see what it was like in Greek. Well, all of us know about Euclid. I don't know whether they still teach uh, geometry in schools today. Um, some young people here can tell me whether they still do it exactly according to Euclid or whether they do anything else. But uh, by, when I went to school, it was all Euclid. And uh, the book starts with five axioms, we know it. And then there are those theorems, proofs, and so on derived entirely by logic, based only on those five axioms. Now the more complicated theorems seem surprising, but some others seem more obvious, at least to me when I was taking those courses, and there were corollaries. And among the theorems was the famous one attributed to Pythagoras, but it was not called after him in Euclid's book. But it spread all over the world and became uh, an extraordinary example of Greek logic. Here are two well-known people, Plato and Aristotle. One is a philosopher, the other one is a logician. And they said some very interesting things. Plato, for example, 
uh, as far as astronomy was concerned, as far as doing the science of the mathematics of it was concerned, his view was that anybody who is a really good man, good, good intelligent person, perfect craftsman in his words, should be able to sit in his little room, locked up, without looking at the skies, without worrying about what's happening else, elsewhere, but should be able to make a system, a mathematics, of predicting what the, what the planetary positions are. You, you can see that, uh, you know, his, uh, uh, his opinion about this. He, he gave great, he, he, he uh, gave great, uh, he saw great possibilities in the human brain so that even if he did not observe it, it could actually do it. Now, the Indians would never have accepted it, but the Greeks said, well, that's the limit of human intelligence. Aristotle had two value of logic. It's either yes or no on everything, but um, in Indian logic, it was not necessarily two valued. Uh, quite often, I'll come to that later on. But the Greeks loved beauty, symmetry, form, and so on at the expense of facts. And I give you some examples. And uh, observe reality, but based on the model of a homospheric universe. I tell you what a homospheric universe is. They thought the universe was a sphere. Why sphere? Because it's symmetric, it's beautiful, you know. <laughs> so their argument was not based on any observation in that sense. It was based on the idea that symmetry is the great thing, and uh, beauty, things like that, uh, were, were given great importance. And that was not true in India at all. The beauty did not, uh, was not a factor in the way that Indians did it. This is what Mr. Plato told his people. The astronomy the harmonics prescribed in Plato's Republic are to have no touch with stellar observation, or with acoustic experiments, or anything. You really don't need it. That's what he was really trying to say. Well, and Euclid's axioms, axioms and proofs, love of uniformity, symmetry, beauty, and universality, okay, at the expense of facts and observed reality, but based on the model of a homospheric universe. A homospheric universe, uh, universe had to be this. It had to be a sphere, first of all, because of the symmetry considerations. But there were many planets. So you see those many planets. They did not believe in vacuum, because I think Aristotle said, uh, nature abhors vacuum. Therefore, it must be filled up with something. But if it's filled up with something, you must be able to see it. Therefore, it must be crystals, and that's to say, transparent glass, something like that. But then the planets are moving at different velocities. How do you see past it? So it's transparent, one, one shell after the other, going around like that. That was their idea of the universe. Well, and then came the revolution after Kepler and Copernicus, Galileo. But just before that, uh, Galileo, around that time, Francis Bacon was the patron saint of a big move in Europe, away from Greece, actually. And there was, of course, a strange and remarkable case of Isaac Newton. I'll come back to him uh, in a little while and uh, ending up more recently about Einstein's God, who doesn't play dice. Well, Ptolemy was the man who wrote the authoritative book on astronomy in Greece. His book is fat. It's just the, just the opposite of Aryabhata's book. Aryabhata's book is only that little thing. It's actually, it's a booklet, really. In fact, I went to the University Museum at uh, Mysore once, because I'd seen in an American directory that there was a table of science from uh, uh, from Aryabhata in Kannada. So I wanted to go get that Kannada thing. Well, they didn't know where it was, but finally they found it. It was only four full scap pages. I could put it in my pocket. That was Aryabhata. But this is now a large number of books. It's a, it's a book that thick. The first chapter is entirely on arguments, hypotheses, axioms, and so on. And geocentric and spherical cosmos some trigonometry tables, and then it goes on with various other astronomical phenomena. Well, the first started with perfect circular orbits. Why? Symmetry, beauty, and so on. 
Then they were forced to do it, leading it to epicycles. Asymmetry was inc inc uh, introduced well, through a deference. That's to say, the center of the circle is not, you draw the circle, but uh, the sun is not at the center of the circle, but a little away from it. Universe was a finite atmosphere, I already said that. Shells of transparent crystal. But the calculations are actually borrowed from the Babylonians, believe it or not. And really, they were influenced by it directly. Yeah. Bacon. This is taken from Bacon's book. Around that time, Europe was beginning to see that the East knew something that they did not know. Just as India felt in the 19th century that the West knew something that we did not know. This is the first man to realize that was, uh, um, you know, Ram Mohan Rai. Uh, Bacon saw that because during the Crusades and their interactions with the, uh, with the Muslims, um, they'd seen that they were doing things which were not understood in, uh, in Europe. So, Bacon actually uh, takes the Greeks to task. Uh, he has a very poor opinion of them. Nearly all the sciences we have come from the Greeks, rhetorical and prone to disputation, inimical to the search for truth, he said. Plato's teachings are the words of, I lord man to callow youths. He, he didn't spare, he didn't spare his criticism at all. Readiness to talk, but inability to produce and so on. So, Aristotle, utterly enslaved his natural philosophy to his logic and made it almost useless and etc. Well, it's that sort of thing. Casual, unregulated experience, badly managed, despised and abandoned. You can see how strong he is. Well, let me not go through that. There are many more things that he said. Yeah. And unlike Indians, they had great trouble with zero, infinity, irrational numbers, and so on. Computation in general. Okay. Well, it can't be zero, no vacuum. Aristotle said no vacuum, can't be zero. And zero was a number with that difficulty. With infinity, they didn't have, because their the home is four, was finite. Irrational numbers. Computation in general was not the strong thing. And the axiomatic excess. Once Euclid had made that very successful book, the other tried to prove all kinds of other things which were actually not true. So one of them proved that the moon is half the size of the earth, which we know to be wrong. And Ptolemy is even accused sometimes of having manipulated his observational data. But you can begin to see influences of Indian thought in Bacon. I already quoted Pratyakshana Anuman in observation and, uh, and inference. Anumana means inference. Of course, in Kannada, Anumana usually means suspe suspicion. But the real meaning in Sanskrit is that it's, uh, it's really inference, the technical meaning. Bacon said, man understands only as much as he has observed of the order of nature. In fact, or by inference. You see, there are only two things there, fact or inference. That was exactly what was the heart of what the Indians had been saying when they did astronomy. These ideas had traveled to Britain and Bacon had heard of that. Okay, let me make, quickly make a call. Yeah, well, I don't think I should really go through this in great detail. Um, I told you, told, told you about Drigganitaikya. I told you about Plato, about the astronomer sitting alone in his home. And um, Greek logic was too valued. Indian logic was not necessarily too valued. Um, four, four possibilities were always allowed. If you have two options, A and B, there are four options. A can be true, B can be false. A can be false, B can be true. Both A and B can be true. Both A and B can be false. Now at first we say, well, that's funny. But you try. This is, a, this is what we used to ask everybody. A glass half full of water is half full or half empty? The question. Well, Indian logic would have no problem with it. 
but I'll start with a problem with it. But Indian philosophy doesn't have any problems with it either. Uh, the Indians saw that language has its limitations, and it depends on what the words mean. It's possible that both of them can be knocked there and so on. So the logic was different. Well, there are these buzzwords: law, theorem, nature, perfection, beauty, universalism. As far as they were concerned, Greeks and the Indians were prayojana, upaya, anumana, ganita, and so on. Drug ganita, I mentioned that. But what was the contribution? If there was any to the European scientific revolution. Now, in 1577, there was that famous comet that Tycho Brahe observed in Europe, and it had an orbit cutting across the nested spheres of the Greeks. Okay, now because they had nested spheres, and they were made of a kind of glass, and if the comet went through it, well, then what happened? What happened to their model? What's happening to those planets and so on? It's a big question. And with the heliocentric model of Copernicus, well, the sun was at the center. Ptolemy's model was abandoned. You see, it, it, it disappeared at the time when these events occurred. Because there was no truth in the Greek theory. If you, you want to make a large conclusion from it, there was no truth. Now, what about India? Well, India's truth uh, lay with, uh, with algorithms and not with exactly what they said. But as late as 1790, Indian astronomical predictions were actually surprisingly good. And, um, Ptolemy's had already been abandoned a few centuries earlier. You know, John Playfair, who was a professor at Edinburgh, uh, wrote a paper on the astronomy of the Brahmins 1790, that's around the time when the East India Company here was getting powerful and some of the literature here in these sciences had been looked at by British scholars who came trained in Sanskrit and they had made these things back, sent back to um, Britain and Playfair comes across this. He, he writes this paper actually. These are his observations. They're much nearer to the truth than Ptolemy. Agreement with Lagrange, you know Lagrange, that man, contemporary, is remarkable. How is it that observations made in India, when all of Europe was still barbarous, this is phrase, barbarous, <laughs> Europe was barbarous, or uninhabited, and those made in Europe 5,000 years afterwards come in mutual support? There is an exact agreement with the con conclusions of Monsieur de Laplace. You can't understand it, how it could have happened. Because they thought that the Indians didn't know anything at that time. So I say, of such high antiquity, therefore, must we suppose the origin of astronomy in India. Some ages ago, there had arisen, maybe some ages ago, there had arisen a Newton among the Brahmins to discover that uh, universal principle and so on. Under Lagrange to trace through the immensity of both is most subtle and complicated operations. So you can see how much it impressed them. It was a, it was a very deep impression left on the, on the academics there, on the scientists. So the Brahmin obtains his results with wonderful certainty and precision. By a rule still more artificial and ingenious, extremely simple, so nearly exact, is extraordinary. But this is his objection to what the Brahmins are doing and the Indians are doing. They follow its rules without understanding its principles. They give no theory. In fact, they are satisfied with calculation. And he's correct, actually. Indians do not have a theory of the kind that Europe was used to, of the kind that Greeks made, tried to, tried to make. But by then, um, Europe was already getting pretty powerful by 1800. But 18, that was uh, you know, more than 100 years after Newton, 1800. So they, they, were, they didn't see how. What were the rules which inspired? What were the um, phenomena that made them use this? Well, Einstein and Euclid, if I start out saying how uh, he was actually uh, very impressed by Euclid's geometry, the axiom had to be accepted unproved. That did not disturb me, so he says. But then he also says, after, uh, at the age of 12 to 16, a few years later, 
I had the good fortune of hitting upon books which were not too particular about their logical rigor. But main thoughts stood out clearly. Truly fascinating. Climaxes were reached. Easily competing with Euclid's geometry. And what were those? Analytical geometry, infinite series, differential and integral. These were all known in India by that time. Uh, <coughs> infinite series were known. Well, by the time of uh, the Kerala hmm, developments, these were all known. Uh, not necessarily in the way that uh, we were taught uh, here in this century, but, uh, but there were elements of all of this. Infinite series were given, they were summed, you know, and um, Madhava found from some, by summing a series up to a certain number of terms, he could, uh, he predicted or he calculated pi to 13 or 14 decimal places. So, and then there was this barbarous algebra. It's called barbarous because they didn't know anything about algebra at all in Europe. So this actually came to them, basically from the Arabs. And uh, that's why the word algebra is used. It is called Bijaganita in India. Bhaskaras Bijaganita is well known. And the Arabs actually took it from, from India. And how do you know that? The Arabs themselves say so. In fact, I must say that the Arabs of that period, of those few centuries, are very really generous to India. Uh, they did not say, we did it, and so on, and tried to avoid it at all. In fact, one of them went so far as to say, what great uh, qualities that these people have, that uh, God has uh, showered on them, these extraordinary gifts our numbers and our, uh, our method of doing mathematics and so on. So when it uh, went to Europe, it was barbarous. It came from these barbarians across on the other side. Well, first of all, he said the Greeks knew it, but they cheated. They didn't, they didn't let it uh, give it to us openly. And never admitted, he never admitted it that it came from the East, although by using the adjective barbarous, he was implying it. And eventually he claimed, I invented it. Of course, nobody expects that he claimed seriously at all. But I, I just have to tell you how these things have all changed. In India, equations could be written in Indian algebra. And here is a notation. Uh, well, I won't go through it uh, to you in any detail. A plus B is uh, the notation which you normally use. And here, in India, the notation was, you said A, B, U. You wrote U, that was a letter. And U is transfer, Yutam is an abbreviation, added. And then, uh, for subtraction, this is funny, for subtraction, the Indians use the word plus here, and less by, that letter, and so on. You can see uh, integers, fractions, AX squared, um, y would be the squared thing, and so on. So there were, there were notations for all of these. Here is how you would write the square root of x plus y. x plus 5 is y. This is an unknown x. 5 is what you multiply it with. It could be a fraction, therefore 5 divided by 1. u is added. mu is the square root of all of this equals y. Okay, This is also denoted by the same symbol. So the use of the same symbol is a bit of a problem, although it, uh, you warned that there are actually two different variables. And other equations like this, well, I can go on. <clears throat> However, there was a kind of new neo-Hellenism after Bacon, and uh, in, uh, uh, let's say, around the 19th century, and early 20th century, uh, many people began to say how the Greek civilization, what do they say here? Only the civilizations that defend, descended from Hellenic Greece have possessed more than the most rudimentary science. The bulk of scientific knowledge is a product of Europe in the last four centuries. Well, there is some truth in the last sentence. We now largely largely learn what Europe discovered in those 400 years. 
and uh, maybe some Greek geometry. But this does not recognize that there was a long period uh, that, uh, that part of the ideas for what happened during those 400 years came really from India. And there was this question that Needham raised. He was a historian of science and so on. And he said, how come, okay, this is actually, this is, this, is a, this is a summary of what I think is a fair statement. With the appearance on the scene of intensive studies of mathematics, science, technology, and medicine in the great non-European civilizations, debate is likely to sharpen for the failure of China and India to give rise to distinctively modern science, while being ahead of Europe for 14 previous centuries. You see, Needham realized, recognized that in fact many of these ideas had come from these two countries. So he's asking, what happened after that? Well, that's a question which we can answer. <laughs> it had to do with all the big political and other changes that were taking place in this country. And he said, how is it that Galilean science came to birth in Pisa, but not in Patna, Peking? It's a question which you have to actually answer. Well, I don't think I spend my time here. China was a leader in technology. If India was a leader in mathematics, China was a leader in, te leader in technology, which of course began to be used in uh, Europe. The magnetic compass, the printing press, you know. Um, so many of these things were actually there. And here is one of modern physicists says, after what you have heard from the others. He said, and once again, I think this is a very fair statement. Occidental mathematics has in past centuries broken away from the Greek view. True. And followed a course which seems to have originated in India and was transmitted with addition stores by the Arabs. In it, the concept of number appears as logically prior to the concepts of geometry. Well, you translate it a little bit. I go back to the title of my talk. It's almost as if he's saying algorithms are prior to axioms in some sense. You have, to, you have to have a method of calculation. And that is very important. That's basically what he's saying. Well, um, there's this thing called positivism. Is any system that relies on data of experience, rejects metaphysical speculation. And in uh, Europe, there was logical positivism, which was very popular for some time. It must be based on positive data of experience. Theology, metaphysics, irrelevant. Animistic, anthropomorphic explanations ruled out. First cause, ultimate reality shunned, and so on. Very, very rational in their ways of thinking. And it raised many questions. And uh, there was Godel's theorem. We said with any set of finite number of axioms, you will always have results which are correct, but you can't prove them. Okay, that was a big surprise, and uh, logical positivism faded out. And scientists analyzed logical positivism, and a particularly tragic case was Boltzmann, who had written a book um, by then on the kinetic theory of gases. It was a mathematical treatment of the kinetic theory of gases. And he wrote down what is known as the Boltzmann equation, which anybody who has to do low density flows will be familiar with. And he assumed that the gases were made up of molecules and so on. He was uh, very violently criticized for doing this. And one year later, he committed suicide. It was really so strong, uh, the criticism of what he did. Tragically, or happily, I don't know what to use, a year later, the French physicist found out by studying Brownian motion that actually there is, a new, there is evidence there of molecules. These molecules are hitting these little things, whatever it is in your um, bowl there. The Indian view, I think, can be legitimately called computational positivism. Computation was for them very important. And um, well, 
it rejects, it tends to reject theories of models unless the observations agree with the calculations. That of course was uh, its strength as far as mathematics of a certain kind was concerned, but I think it was also a weakness. We really did not make general physical models out of this. Yeah. Well, does it make sense? Well, the Greek axioms did not make sense. I've already so I told you that. Okay, there's one slide missing here. I don't know what happened. Is there more than one way of doing science? We can also ask that question. And Feynman was probably the most uh, distinguished theoretical physicist in the second half of the 20th century. He said there are two ways of doing physics, the Greek and the Babylonian. Now the Babylonian is actually somewhat closer to Indic uh, because they also made calculations. But of course not anywhere near what uh, India came, came to. He said I am a Babylonian. I have no preconception about what nature is like or ought to be. Here they are chatting at Caltech. Uh, on our left is Dirac and on the right is Feynman. Uh, they had a little quarrel earlier when Feynman made a result and Dirac said, well, you know, there's no theory about it and so on. It's as if Feynman had come from uh, India in the 14th century. But they talked to each other and finally part as friends. But this is what Dirac says. You see, 100% Greek. It's more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them agree with experiment. Well, that would contradict what the Indians said. <laughs> They're saying, if it does not agree with experiment, it's useless. But he's saying, as long as it's beautiful, it's okay. My equations, he says, are smarter than me. Feynman said, worship the phenomenon, not the explanation. I don't tell nature what to do. She tells me. You see? <laughs> so he didn't have preconceived notions about exactly what the theory should be. And he said, a very great deal more truth can become known than can be proven. So you can see that this has a Babylonian Indic uh, tones about them, uh, rather than about proofs and, uh, and uh, the thing that we mentioned here and here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he had a respect for calculation. I really don't want to go through that uh, in general. But I want you to look at the last sentence there. Logical stuff is a monster, he says. <laughs> it gets involved. It gets involved in very complica complex arguments. I don't know where they're going. So he, 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 had, he had a view which was uh, not, not entirely like the Indian or the Babylonian, but but understood that that was something which had which should not be rejected. Now, what distinguishes science from other knowledge systems? People tell you about how theories are important and so on. They are important. A calculation is important. Calculation is important. But really, the irreducible core of science, in my view, is these principles. Its methods must be replicable. I mean, I can't get, just say I did it, but I won't tell you how I did it. Then it's not science. It must be such that anybody else who wants to do it can do it. It must be consensible and public. It must be widely known, and other people must have found that that is true. It must be effective in prediction, in comparison with experiment and observation. As long as this is done, it is always science. The others are different methods of doing science. So the answer to that question, I think, as Feynman said, it can be more than one. Well, okay, now I should, I think, be finishing fairly soon, Mr. Chairman. Um, what's happening now? Things are changing very rapidly. The computer has changed the way that um, we do science. I remember when the computer came in the United States. I was a student there. I mean, I went there. Caltech had a small computer. Uh, <laughs> 
which won't even match with what you can do on uh, uh, a mobile phone to these days. But um, this is a small one. Mathematicians there didn't like the idea of computer at all. They said computer is going to uh, affect badly uh, analysis, mathematical analysis that will disappear from the sea. And so uh, computers will corrupt you. That was, that was the, roughly the attitude of some of the distinguished mathematicians there. But of course, the computers got very powerful and the use became almost inimitable. And uh, by the time I left, about to leave, in the 1960s, 1962, 61, 62, IBM had made a bigger computer and installed it there. And uh, they were already doing very significant calculations. Now, modern science began some four centuries ago, let's say. And it was in part triggered by the new computational power of the engine numeral system and the techniques of algebra and the new language of equations that accompany the new numbers. Now the other side of AI, yeah, you can of course make a big difference. It's a, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that it's going to make a big impact on the way we live and uh, on the way we may we do science too. But there's also the other side of artificial intelligence. Can it give us any new understanding such as new principles or laws? Well, unlikely by itself, but some new patterns never seen before, and they, they can be seen. They can be seen with AI, and we might never have been able to do that without without artificial intelligence. So, the theories and the laws had, may have to be modified again and again. Well, Indian astronomers would not be surprised by that, although having a theory, good theory actually worthwhile. So it's the sequence in astronomy, basically I put that down there. Well, they have the, they have the power to change epistemologies, that's to say what you think of uh, science. Uh, well, that's roughly what we did long ago. And they're becoming power tools now, powerful, powerful tools now, as high performance computing moves towards excess scale and uh, they will reach it before long. Quantum computing is coming up and Google claims that their quantum computer can now do in 200 seconds what the present supercomputer will take 10,000 years. Look, look at the extraordinary change that uh, artificial intelligence and these new computers are actually making. So is it possible that computational positivism will return to the world? Well, can't rule it out. And there is one man. I'm now very close to the end. Sorry if I took a little more time. A Russian mathematician, well, not mathematician, Satan. It's a pure mathematician. He didn't believe, uh, he didn't believe in all this uh, business about calculation and so on. Um, but uh, he, he gave a lecture, this was uh, about uh, 1980, 81, where he talks about uh, well, the subject of what mathematics should be. Slowly, he changed his views from the belief that good knowledge must always be represented as heterological statements. His research was all based on this premise. And even while he was doing research following these rules, within a suitable math mathematical model of reality, to my present opinion, knowledge is basically algorithmic. So he, he makes this very definite statement that it is algorithmic. It occurred to me that mathematical questions might be no more meaningful, meaningful than questions about characters in some novel. Okay, <laughs> they're there and we find some relations between them, but I don't know whether it's actually reality or keeps, keep, things will change. The physicists were very, uh, had great sympathy for him. <laughs> and they said, he said, the, I, the, the, the only French he had, the physicists, who came and told him, well, you know, mathematics, you are approaching like, like, like you are becoming like physics. 
for him. An algorithm in the mathematical science is completely self-contained. But as soon as the data have been specified, this needs no further information. He says, it's more economical than all your axioms and theories and so on. And really, therefore, that's what he decided to pursue from then on. Now, this, is, that this had been said a little more than a thousand years ago. Indian mathematicians would have been very pleased to say that that's what they've been doing all along. So, well, I don't have time for this. So I conclude. Computational positivism is a philosophical system implicit in the classical Indic approach to astronomy. Depended on computational procedures that yielded agreement with observation. Rejected a priori models of theories. Metaphysics was ruled out. So, okay, so in India, you see, in India also metaphysics was ruled out. What the Europeans said was positivism, logical positivism. In Indian mathematics, the well-known Indian mathematics did not appeal to metaphysics at all. Well, science is a parsimonious description of nature through algorithms. And uh, without any commitment of use in the scriptures, or to anything like the Greek insistence on the notion of the perfect, beautiful, and so on. Does it make sense? Well, it worked well for 1,400 years and uh, has begun to work again. Uh, we don't know whether it's going, where it's going. Uh, the Greeks had made these unjustified excesses, arbitrary axioms, gave you strange results. You normally don't uh, find it in the books. You have to read some real history of <laughs> Greek mathematics. And I gave out a book, for example, to find out that funny axioms were made and funny results were got. It triggered the European Revolution, underestimated, it underestimated the potential power and universality of choosing model with algorithm. It may make a partial return. Um, you know, with artificial intelligence and so on. This is just one thought from Bacon. So why do we need knowledge? and why truth and so on. This was the European definition, Bacon's definition in England of what knowledge and power meant to him. Human knowledge and human power come to the same thing. Truth and usefulness are the very same things. It is this identification of knowledge with power and truth with usefulness that I think led not only to the scientific revolution in Europe, but to the book political revolution that occurred over the world as Europe became the major power, partially controlled the whole globe. Well, I... Well, I think AI and quantum computing will have, certainly, certainly have a profound influence on the way we live. They may detect patterns that have never crossed the human mind. They will, uh, in general, not be able to propose axioms are a useful theory, most probably. And as Gödel proved, no innumerable set of axioms can prove all the results in the domain covered by the axioms in any case. Well, what I feel is that science will probably continue to discover new results using whatever method, logic, axioms, algorithms, theories, you see most convenient for progress of knowledge maybe in a, some strange mix of Greek and Indic thinking and other ways of thinking that have come up uh, in the rest of the world. But as Satan said, only algorithms will have truth. And rational philosophies in science, to go to the last lines there, have been strongly influenced by culture, environment, perception of technology and history. Well, uh, we don't, Indians don't think like Europeans. I mean, I can talk about that separately. But I don't, I'm going to finish with this. I don't know how many of you have read a brilliant essay by um, A.K. Ramanujan. We used to have this, I don't know, my days here at Nyash. <laughs> we used to circulate it. 
uh, it's a wonderful analysis of Indian thinking and Western thinking. And I strongly urge you to take a look at it. If you want, you can write to me. I send you a copy. Uh, he first of all recognizes that there are differences in the way we think. And the Europeans thought, well, this is not the right way to think. We thought that they were thinking was not the right way to think. Why is this difference? Well, we are two different civilizations. Our civilizations don't have the same values. And um, um, he says that in India, things are context sensitive. The decisions you make, what you actually do, the action you take, depends on the context. Should you tell the truth? There is that whole thing in Manu. Satyam bruyat, priyam bruyat, ma bruyat satyam priyam. But that doesn't mean that uh, you should <laughs> you should uh, never tell a lie. So, this is all these alternatives were there. And so, there's a, the things that Indians prefer, the way they do it, has been culturally, civilizationally different from what's been done in the West. And even if we follow their own textbooks and follow their own research, those attitudes will probably not immediately go away and they have their value. Thank you very much. Professor Nam Narsima, can I take a few questions? Yes. Sure. Yes. So you have mentioned about the computation and positivism. Uh, when the Stephen Wolfram, Stephen Wolfram, yeah, like he is also like proposing that computational thinking, right? Now, a lot of time goes into making the models, and many people are actually not good in doing math. So instead, he says that they use computer kind of algorithmic approaches using computer so that the outcome will, we can solve the problem faster without getting got stuck in the mathematical details. I actually had two cuts on Wolfram. Uh, uh, I, I didn't go through it, not enough time. I've read that book and um, it has some very interesting points. But it was um, also very severely criticized because I think that what he was proposing was not rich enough to cover the spread of all the sciences and the mathematics that we will need for continuing our uh, efforts at understanding the universe. <clears throat> so while it was uh, interesting, it didn't seem sufficiently powerful to be able to change over completely. And so, as you will have noticed, it slowly uh, began to be ignored. However, the recent world, the recent things, recent developments in computer technology and the doubts that are arising in some of the mathematicians' minds, like the one that I quoted from Satan. That makes the situation different. And I think it, uh, it may not be the simple sort of uh, things that, uh, um, you know, um, what's that name that you mentioned? That, uh, hmm that he used, where you made these uh, entries, with symbols, and so on. I don't, I don't know whether that's going to develop a great deal more. But I do think these other things will. Because uh, the few mathematicians are themselves beginning now to ask a question. That they're not going to abandon that other thing, computations and so on. So, I don't think it is so much what he said but rather the other discussions that are now beginning to go on. Sir, you that there was some kind of a connect between the Indians and the Greeks at that time. Sorry? Ah. So I was interested to know if uh, any of the Indian astronomers and mathematicians of that time, did they pass any comments on the Greek way of doing maths or vice versa? Did any of the Greek mathematicians of that time, were they aware of the Indian work and did they pass any comments on the Indian way of uh, uh, doing mass and astronomy. Yeah. Well, there were contacts, but the contacts were not strong. After all, Alexander came here, third century BC. But when Alexander came, he had heard, he had known 
that there is some kind of very valuable knowledge in India. He was an Aristotle student. And uh, one of the things that his guru told him, okay, you know, there are some, suppose, this, I hear, we hear that there are some very wise men in India. Why don't you go talk to them and find out what they are? So he actually brings, takes a group of scholars with him. And the scholars and the, the scholars from India and the scholars from Greece actually have arguments or questions and answers. And if you read Plutarch, you know, Plutarch wrote a book about the lives of the Romans and the Greeks, the big ones. So he talks about Alexander. And there's an absolutely fascinating conversation between the Indian pundits and uh, the Greek uh, scholars. And, uh, well, I, I can't uh, recount all of that in detail. So they knew it. But it was not a very close, it was not, uh, it was not a very close uh, link between the two. That distance was there, there was a lot of territory in between. Uh, however, the Indians did take something from the Greeks. Not their axioms, not their theories and so on. But where they found something which they could do in their own style from the Greeks, they did that. Uh, I once again skipped that slide there. But if you looked at, there were also two more, the five, five leading systems in India in those days. And one came from Rome and one came from Greece. There's one is Yavana and one is Rava, Roma, Romsha. And they rank them. The first one is always uh, the Brahman Siddhanta. Okay? Uh, this is done over a period of two, or two periods, separated by about a century or two. But meanwhile, in that, in that interval, the Siddhanta's ranking has changed. Uh, the Brahma Siddhanta remains at the top. Uh, earlier, the, uh, the Greek thing came second. Uh, the, that went lower down on the list. And some of the other Indian things came up. Romans was in between. So they were ranked. So they, they knew something about it. But beyond that, I don't think uh, their, their methods did not change, as far as I can see. And their methods did not change at all. I think they had uh, considerable confidence in their methods, and not in what the Greeks were doing. Sorry? It's in Plutarch's lives. Okay. It's, it's a fairly fat book. Plutarch uh, collects the lives of all the great men, One here both in Rome and in Greece. Yes, Sorry. Sir. Ah, that's a very good question, actually. <coughs> um, as far as I know, uh, I may be wrong here, I'm not absolutely sure. As far as I know, as I've not read it in the original, uh, it's hard to say for me whether they had a separate uh, symbol for a derivative. But they did the operation. And uh, that operation was done uh, and so by, so by showing, so for example, they actually had the Taylor McLaurin series for a function. Okay, you have a function, and that has a series with uh, terms, uh, all correct actually. Uh, but um, I cannot immediately tell you whether they had a separate symbol for it or not, because what I've seen is a translation in English, and I'm not. I must go. The is in that original Malayali book, which I have to see, which I have not seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Sir, you mentioned about this algorithmic approach, which is very useful in, from the point of view of utility. And I accept that. But if we consider a human being, which is a very <coughs> curious person, like by nature, and if we see these exams and all those things, and if we see that, okay, just to appreciate the beauty of mathematics or numbers or any other thing, if they follow the exams and just try to see the beauty out of that, then it should still be okay, right? Well, I think the mathematicians uh, should have the freedom to pursue whatever they think is interesting to them. Right? I don't, know, I, I don't deny that at all. But I think their taste will also depend on what's happening in uh, the rest of the subjects. 
you know, in physics and in uh, technology, engineering, whatever. It will take time for a change to occur. But I'm, I'm one of those people who say, if somebody thinks that he can do it in some way, he should go ahead and do it. There are people to judge. So that's all. Yeah. And it might be some hybrid too, you know. I, we don't know exactly in which way it will develop. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, question? sir. I'll take the liberty of asking you one question. <laughs> okay. Sure. Uh, when we speak about uh, history of Indian science and mathematics, we al always speak about Aryabhatta, huh. but not so frequently about Varaha Mihira, who was the co contemporary. Yeah, right. But why is that? Well, for two reasons. First of all, I can't go through all of them. <laughs> There's not time. Because I wanted to make this other point. Secondly, Aryabhatta was the man who left the longest impression in India. His, what he did, really, provided the template, so to speak. Uh, the fact that 121 shlokas affected people till, well, it was, it was a big thing in Kerala. In Kerala, the Kerala people made commentaries on Aryabhati once again. Uh, that, was, that was the beginning. He was sort of the Newton of India. I mean, although he was not like, uh, his philosophy was not Newton's. But uh, he was really uh, like what uh, Newton was in, uh, in uh, Europe and in the world. He said some things, and everybody else built, built on it, almost, almost built on it in India. So I think we have to know about Aryabhata, first one, and also the one who showed the road, which was the by and large follow. Of course, there were other people like Varami, Ratman. there were quite a few people. And if you take that period, say from 500, 400 to 1,000, 400 or 1,500, more than 1,000 years. There were many other people who did so there, very well known. I've not even mentioned Bhaskara, for example. Brahma Gupta. Who made Brahma Gupta. There were yes. <laughs> there many, many, many people who I did not mention. Because I wanted to argue the point rather than go sure. through every one of them. That should be done too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Please come. As a token of our appreciation and uh, as a souvenir for the event, uh, we have a small certificate that I will request Professor uh, Ramamurthy to present to you. Thank you. On behalf of uh, NIAS director, staff, students, and faculty at NIAS, I thank Professor uh, Narsima for uh, uh, delivering this uh, lecture. A very interesting lecture, and we are hoping that it will trigger off interest in this area at NIAS. I request uh, uh, director, Dr. Shailesh Nayak, to present a memento. <laughs> Thank you. I thank uh, Professor Narsimha for delivering this wonderful lecture. I thank Professor uh, uh, Ramamurthy for chairing the session. I thank all of you for coming here and making this discussion very interesting. Thank you one and all.